Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Image of Beatles meeting, which is a little bit unusual because we are first time pressed to do half online way. And it's also unusual for me because it's first time when I'm not really based in Prague, but I'm actually sitting and recording this in Taiwan at the moment. The reason why I'm in Taiwan is also actually the topic of this talk. So the project I'm trying to run here is focused on beetles naturally. It's focused on forests, nice forests in Taiwan and the leave little beetles there. So the topic is the using of DNA barcoding to explore the diversity of beetles uh, and the larvae in forest leaf litter in Taiwan. I am actually not working alone. Taiwan is really cool at having really many really good entomologists. So besides of me, uh, you will see later during this talk Fang Shou and Bing Hong, who are both students at the National Chongqing University in Taichung, uh, who are uh, helping me with that. Fang Shou did lots of the management of the project and lots of the lab work, and he is also responsible for the Staffelinit results. Bing Hong joined us for one specific uh, side project concern, uh, Scorabs, because he's a local student of Scarab Beetles. And then, because we have to do lots of lab work, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, kind of get the offer from Ren Pan Huang, who is the researcher in Academia Sinica in Taipei, to use his lab. So me and Fang Shuo were actually sitting in his lab in Taipei the complete summer doing all the lab work. And uh, Han is research assistant working in Renpan's lab, who actually was helping us with all the new things we have to learn, including the lab protocols, the bioinformatics, and so on. So to show you what we will actually talk about, uh, this talk will have three parts. So first will be the general introduction of the project and uh, some kind of brief summary of our preliminary results and then we will switch to some actual beetles. First we will talk about these Oxyomus beetles, uh, which uh, Bing Hong will tell you about with a little bit of support of mine. And then Fang Shou will introduce you some surprising discovery of the larva of Tolmerimus, which is the stuff Renet that means his special group. Okay, so let's switch my face to another corner. And let's start. So probably if you go to any kind of forest, you can imagine that if you sample the leaf litter, this is the place where you find really, really rich uh, fauna of invertebrates. So incredibly rich that actually many people, including me, we really love to go to these forests, especially when these are tropical forests, uh, sample there and check all these cool animals living there. So we are sampling using this device called sifter, which kind of sorts the fine uh, dirt for, uh, and, and the animals from the big pieces of leaf, which we leave in the forest. And then we usually put uh, the samples into these things, uh, which, is, which are so-called funnels. We have two types. Uh, some of them called Berlesi funnels uh, have the uh, bulbs inside. Uh, some others, the white ones, uh, without the bulbs, are called Winkler funnels. So I'm actually using the Winkler funnels mostly. This is what uh, you can find just one meter next to me. Uh, I have two Winklers permanently hanging in my window. And every time I bring some sample from outside, I actually put the dirt inside of these perforated bags, which are hanging uh, in the Winklers. And uh, these allows the samples to or the dirt to dry dry up also i'm mixing it twice a day and all the animals hiding there i act are actually kind of uncomfortable with that so they try to leave and once they try they basically fall down to the jar of alcohol which is ready for them there so in this case we can actually quickly extract the specimens it takes like three days and then we get this. So always once I get the beetles, uh, so these are already the beetles sorted. It's not all the animals in the samples. There's only the beetles sorted. You can see there are quite many. But usually when I got this kind of beetles sorted from a sample or even all invertebrates, I was always so curious, okay, what I collected? Because finally I can see all these animals which are uh, hidden 
in this place and was it this place something good was it because sometimes i go to some very distant forest is it something really hosting interesting beetles or or not so here you can see two uh, examples one from the nice forest in this rounded petri dish and one from the quite a horrible secondary place here in kaohsiung and you can see that in both of them we actually have really really many beetles so it's really full of beetles and we want to know what is there it's actually not from kind of big big sample we usually take something like six liters of uh, of uh, this fine leaf litter which you can imagine like 12 half a liters of beer by volume it's about 15 to 30 minutes of work to collect this so really not much it's not that super big leaf litter amount as as many other people are collecting and still all these samples are full full of beetles but if you ask me how many species specimens whatever are there i can only tell you many that was actually the main disappointment of mine i was lucky enough that i have been sifting all around the world for the last 15 years if you go to the national history museum in prague you will find there are thousands of mounted specimens from, from these expeditions and actually also two freezers full of samples which are still not mounted. But always, in for all expeditions and all samples I ever studied, never it never happened that the beetles were really examined. And I think that most beetles have never been studied and they will never be studied because there are actually too many. Too many specimens, too many species. Very often they belong to the groups which nobody knows. We have no, not the weakest idea about their taxonomy, about their systematics. And even in groups when there are some specialists, there are actually very few and their capacity is quite limited. So they usually are not really very able to work on every sample I collected. And moreover, in these 15 years there was not a single sample ever in which we would be able to identify all the things hiding in the sample. So always some specialists kind of picked up this, oh this is a weird thing, this is a rare thing, this, this got described and, and studied, but most of the specimens were never touched. So I was actually always dreaming how it would be cool if we can somehow quickly identify all things in every sample. We would be able then to do the taxonomy much better because I can easily see, wow, I have something interesting there, which is a colleague in, in the, uh, some other country is studying, so I can send him the specimens. I would be able to identify the larvae in my groups, so I will be able to, uh, to describe their morphology, use it for phylogenetics uh, studies, but also when I know what is the species that I have adults and larvae, I can study the biology of this species, which is also something which we have no data about for most of the little things. And at the end, if we can actually identify most things in most samples, we can finally start to compare the samples among each other. So I can, for example, compare uh, the samples here in Kaohsiung with the samples in Taipei and see, okay, is it somehow similar? Is it some, somehow different? Or I can check the effect of climate change on leave little beetle communities or I can change the effect of uh, check the effect of uh, of different forest management for example this is actually the information which uh, many other people are kind of are, are asking us for so they say okay you collect this weird tiny beetles which nobody cares about but can these beetles tell us something interesting about the environment and we they naturally they can but we don't have access to this information because we have so much troubles to identify things. So my dream was to somehow find a way and I naturally did not discover any new way. I am that not that kind of genius. So the idea was to try something which is called DNA barcoding. So DNA barcoding's idea is basically to take a short piece of DNA which uh, we will sequence for our new specimen and we compare it to another short pieces of DNA stored in the database for which we have the identification and we can say okay it has the same DNA so it is this species or it has different DNA so it's a different species and we can do it also with the larva because larva naturally has the same DNA as the adult so we can say, say that oh this larva has the same DNA 
as the adult, so these two belong together. Actually, there are some problems. So if I use this Oryctes as an example of a beetle, which is naturally not the beetle we can get in leaf litter in Taiwan, uh, but this Oryctes, uh, we actually only look at the mitochondrial DNA. So this is not, this is like very tiny part of the genome. Uh, mitochondrial DNA of Oryctes has about 21,000 base pairs, which is 21,000 letters. But actually, we don't even look at complete this amount of data. We only check one gene, which is called Cytochromoxidase 1. And not even the complete gene, we only take... 60, 658 base pairs, 758 letters of it. And this is the only piece of DNA we use in this DNA barcoding. For the reason it was actually criticized, so if you use it in some quick, dirty way, you can do quite a horrible job, as it happened, for example, with this uh, paper published recently. They described more than 400 new species of braconid was basically only based on this short, uh, short DNA uh, sequence and a bad photo, which was criticized for very good reasons. This is not the way we want to follow. But there are also some good examples. Maybe you know the nice studies by Rx Rido, uh, focused on the leaf litter uh, weavers of the genus Trigonopterus. So Alex was combining the DNA barcoding with some very carefully and properly done systematics and morphology studies, and his work was really brilliant. This was the kind of a uh, dream for me to do something like that for for the Taiwanese leaf litter beetles. So this is what we are kind of trying. Uh, so we knew that it will not be quite easy. So in 2019, we actually selected one locality where uh, we wanted to try and start. This is called Kwesun Forest Era, as in central Taiwan. And with the first set of samples, uh, Fang Shou came to Prague. It was at that time funded by a synthesis uh, project. Uh, he was for one month in the museum and we tried to sequence. Uh, so Fang Shou presented this in the Taiwanese Entomological Meeting in 2019. So I have stolen a few of his slides to show you what we have found. So we selected five different localities with slightly different kinds of forest. For each locality, we sampled these six liters of leaf litter, we, uh, we separated all the beetles. For every morphospecies species we found in every sample, we sequenced one to two specimens. We extracted DNA, got the normal sequences uh, using the Sanger sequencing, we get the photos. As a result, we got something like 76% of all samples. Uh, for, for this amount, we got the DNA which was something about 180 species of beetles. Typically, we got um, between 35 to 60 species per sample. And weirdly, there was about 40 species which were only present as larvae. We are not sure whether this is because of seasonality or something. So this is what we are now continuing on, on as, uh, uh, investigating. But definitely, it shows that if you want to compare uh, the diversity of leaf litter communities, you have to consider larvae as well. We were lucky enough to associate some of the adults with the larvae. So this is the case of this Oxyomus, which we will talk about later. This is the case about this Cirmenine, which has this weird ball-like uh, end of abdomen in the larva. This larva is now in hands of Pavel Yaloshinsky, and we had a few more. But we also got many problems. So for methodology problems, the one problem was that the extraction take too long. So for 500 specimens, which is something what you get from six leaf litter samples, you need like six to 10 days of hard work. That means from early morning to late night. So it's not, not really the way which we need. If you want to have some quick idea of what we collected, you can collect six samples in one day, right? So you need a little bit quick way how to look inside. Also, we get many contaminations, which were from bacteria or fungi, probably from the environment or from what is living in the intestines of these beetles. And many beetles fail to amplify in PCR. I was kind of struggling what to do with this, 
And uh, I met this guy, his name is Rudolf Meyer. He's working in National University in Singapore, where he's running a big barcoding project on identifying or inventorizing uh, Singapore's biodiversity. Uh, and I was discussing with him, I told him about the problems, and he actually told me two things. One was try next generation sequencing, that means Illumina or Nanopore. This will help you to solve contaminations and it will make your work like cheaper and quicker. And the second message was, oh, Beatles, oh, good luck because we tried them and they are really tricky. So it seems that for some reason, Beatles are actually more difficult to work with than the Diptera, which, which Rudolf is normally doing. He also published, or his team also published this nice paper recently. It's not yet out totally. It's in, available in BioArchive. Uh, and we actually, after some discussions, decided that we will try to take this kind of workflow and try to optimize it for our Leave Little Beatles. So this is actually the topic of this so-called phase two, which is now funded by the Ministry of Science and Technology here in Taiwan. And this is what we are doing now this year. The goals are to implement the Oxford Nanopore, or so-called Minayan technology, uh, to test some quicker methods of DNA extraction and ideally also to try to figure out some better combinations of primers which we can use. If you are not uh, aware of this uh, Oxford Nanopore technology, or uh, this is basically something which you can do on your table. So you need this small box which is called Minion device. You plug it into your computer using the USB and if you download the program which they provide with this machine, you can basically sequence on your table. The good thing is, but also the tricky thing is that uh, even the smallest device, we use the smallest one, which is called Flungle Flow Cell, uh, it can sequence about 300 samples in one run, which means through three full plates of samples. So we, ha we have to mix them and later somehow kind of demix them uh, to, to recognize each other. So we had to learn actually the library preparation, what to do before we load all of that into this small box and how to work with the data. Uh, one of the problem was that naturally we had to somehow mark the sequence from each plate and each position in the plate because later we will mix them. So we have to have some way how to, how to recognize them. This we actually uh, did following Meyer's suggestion using the so-called tag, which is additional 13 letters at the end of this sequence, which are added in the forward and reverse phase. Forward uh, part um, kind of signed each plate and the reverse part signed each position in each plate. And after some failures, we finally got this, uh, which is how what you can see on your screen once you are sequencing uh, using this, uh, this box. Each green square is the pore, which is at that moment reading your DNA. Uh, for the quicker extractions, uh, we tried uh, two ways, so-called hotshot mixture and the uh, phosphate PBS buffer. Uh, in both cases, you just take a little bit of this liquid, you put the beetle in. If it is too big, you just put it like head first into that. And you put it into the cycler for 20 minutes to one hour, so it's quite quick. We tested uh, different taxa, like tiny beetles, middle-sized beetles, large beetles. We tested larvae and adults. We tested things like curculionids, which has very strong uh, body wall. And uh, we also tested all of these categories for, uh, for the intact beetle and for the beetle with the hole in the body wall. And because the DNA extracted in these methods is not very long lasting, you can keep it in freezer for like one week, but then it degrades. We also were interested whether it's actually possible to take the specimen extracted in this way and re-extract it using the usual kits to get like the much better uh, pure DNA, which you can later use for like more sequencing in case you get something really interesting in your samples on which you need to work more, for example. The results are actually quite uh, optimistic. So both methods work very fine. There's no need to make any hole into the beetles, so you can just put them there. And actually the problem was not, uh, not enough DNA. The problem was totally the opposite. So we got too much DNA. 
So especially for these big betas, uh, the problem with PCRs was that we had to dilute. So we will somehow try to figure out uh, how to do it without needing to, to measure the DNA concentration. So we can somehow do it later kind of routinely. And for the repeated re-extraction, it actually works. So these methods, these quick methods will actually not kill the serious research on, on the specimens you run through it because you can still use the specimens for normal extraction and do the normal DNA work later with them. We also use the primers, but uh, it's somehow not yet uh, working well. You can see that some results were not really not really optimistic, so this needs much more work. Okay, so and now I will, we will switch to beetles, so I will give word to Bing Hong who will continue. I am Bing Hong Ho from Taiwan. Today I will introduce about Oshomas in Taiwan and the Islava. Oshomas is a genus belongs to Arctine, about 30 known species. The members usually small and mainly distributed in Europe to Southeast Asia. The type species Oshomas selvichis are also known and introduced to North America. About the larva of this genus are only known from the type species by Richard 19066. In one day, Feng Shuo told me he collected some tiny scrub larvae and uh, adults from Huishun forest area by leaf litters. Best specimens is mine. I determined the adults belongs to genus Oshomas and the larvae still unknown. After the DNA extraction, we found that the larvae are the same as uh, the adults. So this will the second species of Oshomas larva to be known since 1966. This figure is adults of all Taiwanese Oshomas. There are three known species and the Huishun species. We can see the morphological of Huishun species is different from other Taiwanese species. The characteristics is more similar to the Thailan species Oshomas cocoti, but the middle growth on pronotum and the scutellum is slightly different. We will continue this case in the near future. With revised all Taiwanese species together. I'm Fang Shuohu from Taiwan. I will talk about the Tomernus larva. The genus Tomernus is diverse in the subtribe Anisolinina, but never revised. Therefore, there are hundreds of new species are waiting to describe. So far, the larva of the subtribe Anisolinina are undescribed. Only the larva of their creatures has been scoring for the morphological phylogeny but no other known larva of Anisolidina. A few years ago, I got a larva of Tormenus in the field course of my university, and I read it to adult. But I only got a single larva, so I still have not described it. The larva were found under the stone on the grassland near a lowland forest. This year, we want to test the quick DNA extraction for the leaf litter beetles. But we don't know, we don't want to take our real sample for the test. Hence, Martin went to sift some leaf litters near his place in Kaohsiung in Taiwan to get some fresh specimens for testing. One day, he sent me a photo of the adult rove beetles. I said, oh, it's probably some species of Anisolinina that are common in some place. But when I checked the samples, I found some familiar lava. I'm surprised. It looks very similar to the lava of Tormenus, which I collected a few years ago. We tried to get the barcodes of both lava and adults. They are identical. The adult morphology fit the Hong Kong species Tormenus fratumilantorum, a new record in Taiwan. Later, Martin went to Huishun to collect the sample of this year. He got another Tormenus lava, but much smaller. 
He also collects some smaller terminus adults from the same sample. But the adult morphology is quite different. We tried to barcode them. A larva was identical to the smaller species. However, the code 1 divergence of these species and Hong Kong species are very high. The difference even over 20%. We will start to describe the lava and compare them to the lava of the diatrichus. The lava of Ptolemonus is similar to the lava of Staphylina, but it has long and slender legs. They are very distinct long two segment urogomorphy. It sometimes even makes problems because we were shifting strong. Those urogomorphy will break. That is why we don't have too many complex lava. The first, half of part, the first half part of the urogomorphy of the mature larva even from a pseudo segment. You can check the, the figures. I'm not sure if any other staphylin larva have similar characters. They also have the protibial antennal cleaner cup such as low staphylin. The morphology of both species of Ptolemonus is also very different especially of the chatoxis of on the thorax. The species from the Huisun with much fewer CT on the thorax. We will observe them in more detail and illustrate them. Hopefully we will find more characters. Thank you for your attention. Are there some questions?